All right, I think we're live. Welcome to Retire Japan TV, the show where we talk about personal finance, investing, retirement, and life in Japan. And joining us today is Derek Westman, who I think is the James Bond of living in Japan. He has a very particular set of skills, skills that make him very useful in the community. Volunteer, firefighter, political intern, deputy, chonai guy head. Derek owns a couple of businesses in Japan and is intimidatingly productive. I am frankly in awe of him. Thanks for joining us today, Derek. <laughs> Thanks for having me. What, a, what an introduction. I'll have to dispel a lot of that. Yes. In the conversation. <laughs> so let's start with the firefighting because that is really cool. And、uh, so, how do you get into that kind of thing here in Japan? Yeah.、Um, so, I,、uh, I got into the Volunteer Fire Corps on my second try, actually.、Um, I was living in a, in, a, in a neighborhood previously, and I asked if I could join. And the, the fellow who was in charge of that little area said he didn't think foreigners were allowed.、Uh, and so he kind of just like,、um, you know, didn't let me in. And then later I, we, we moved and built a house in a, different, in a different neighborhood, also in the same area of Takao in, in, in the west part of Hachioji here. And, he,、uh, and, and in that neighborhood, A father of one of my kids' friends at school said, You're going to be in the volunteer fire corps. And I was like, Yeah, I wanted to be before. And he,、uh, and they let me in. And there, there is no rule against、um, foreigners, by the way, being in volunteer fire corps. So I think, yeah, people、uh, probably、so、get、in. confused with the public servant law or something.、And... They do, exactly. Yeah. And you're a public servant, you're what's called a、uh, special. Special public servant, special something public servant. I can't remember the exact term, but、um, it's just, you know, you're just a non full time、um, yeah, public servant. Right. And when did you start doing that? That was 2016. Wow. Okay. So you're, you're like seven years in. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's I got my、hardcore. five year certificate、uh, a couple years <clears> back. <throat> exactly. It, it's, it's really not hardcore, is the thing.、Um, See, I see these like summer training <laughs> things and like all night、yeah. like shifts and like, you know, spraying water. Every, I'm like, it seems pretty hardcore. What's every the time commitment? Every once in a while.、Like? The time commitment is,、um, well, it varies a little bit,、um, but we do one thing a month, one, one, one meeting as a squad, as a neighborhood squad per month. And a squad of ours is a boo, they call it, is, is like fif- 15 people max. Ours is about 12. I think. And so you'd go meet at the fire, your little volunteer firehouse. And、uh, what they call it, the main thing you're doing is running the pump so it doesn't get you know, old,、uh, so it doesn't deteriorate. You run the pump, make sure it's in good repair. You drive the car a little bit,、uh, the truck、uh, around. And then you、oh, meet、cool. about any you know, administrative matters. So it's like a two, three hour thing. And that's once a month for sure. And then fire calls, the city disaster section is who calls us to a fire. And if there's a fire within our、um, not just one squad, but several squads together area that's called a bundan, then、um, they'll always send us to it. And so that'll be twice or three times a month, I would say, is, is average.、Okay. In the、and、winter, that, is more. And that comes at any time. Yeah, that'll come at any time. And that comes by email.、Um, it comes to us by email. It used to be that the,、um, the firehouse in the neighborhood, they would actually crank a siren and、uh, call the firefighters to. I'm sure、action. that was popular with the community. Yeah. <laughs> Those were in the more, I think,、um, community oriented days where you just didn't, you didn't complain about that. But、uh, now it comes by email.、Uh, I've slept through several, of course. But.、Um, <laughs> Like,、and、hey, then, yeah, I got then, your email、yeah. yesterday. How was the yeah, fire? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and our group has a group line because, of course, you got to be online、oh. on the, the app line. And that's,、um, that's how we share, you know, I'm going, I, I can't go if there's, a, if there's an email. Okay. So it's, it's kind of voluntary. Oh, yeah. It's,、uh, the, the rule is, you know, you, you prioritize work, you prioritize family if needed.、Um, there's no. Compulsory aspect to it.、Um, some of the members of our squad are just completely unable to、uh, make it most of the time. And that's just understood.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
but okay. the the but it but it it still means something to belong because in a big disaster or something is when really I think the volunteer fire corps uh, will be most useful. Um, not you and know, you not get as first much, dibs yeah. on the supplies, right? Yeah, well, we uh, we get first dibs on we get last dibs on evacuating. <laughs> Oh, right. I guess is the main. That's the uh, downside, right? The main thing. Yeah. You get all this cool gear, but you get left behind. And the... we we do get quite a bit of gear. I mean, they they give us these things that we just don't know if we'll ever use. You know, um, somebody in the the Somu Show, uh, the Ministry of Internal Affairs is the is the ministry that's over firefighting, and they will send us just you know like backpacks or you know something, and we might use them someday. It's that kind of <laughs> nice so what what are the upsides of being in the in the group apart from getting to play with toys and and kind of hanging out once a month with the guys well i mean those are those are two big ones i mean <laughs> uh in 2019 there was the typhoon 19 you know uh that that was pretty um big in kanto area you know for flooding and things and our our river flooded so we we were you know, it was it was it was a good experience in in um, seeing how a disaster of a very small scale at that point, luckily, would play out in our neighborhood, and um, so that was good. Uh, I would say the camaraderie and the just the it's a good group of people because everybody is self selectingly volunteer. So I mean, even if a person's kind of a you know a bad personality, they've at least got the feeling to volunteer for their community, you know, so there's a nice baseline there and driving a fire truck is a lot of fun. Uh, that <laughs> sounds good. Though. Yeah. Yeah. You get to drive around and do the Hino Yojin in the winter then like exactly. Things. We do exactly. And, uh, you know, that's, a, that's a, a fun tradition. Um, winters here are dry. So, you know, more fires do happen in winter and more people leave their homes during Shogatsu to go places. So, it's a bit of a, a bit of an effect, but it's also just kind of a tradition. So there's a there's a combination of tradition and actual function, I think, there. Very cool. So if yeah. someone was interested in, in getting started on on doing that, what would you suggest they do? Right. I mean, so it's really variable because each each municipality basically is um, left to their own devices as far as volunteer firefighting goes. But I would say uh virtually every municipality in Japan has a volunteer fire corps. So if somebody wants to join, um, I would find out where the closest one is to your, you know, where you want to be and first probably get acquainted with some of the members of it. Um, and that of course, you know, if you can catch them on a day where they're doing stuff at their, at their firehouse, ah, right. uh, you know, and they're out front working with the pumps and they're, they're running their generators and stuff. Um, you know, introduce yourself and say that you're interested in it. Uh, you'd need to have decent Japanese. Um, they, you know, they probably assume that there will be situations where if you don't understand what's being, you know, the instructions that are being given and things like that, you know, that dangerous situations could happen. So mm -hmm. I don't think that zero Japanese uh, speaking would be, would be, you know, workable. Um, but yeah, get acquainted with them. Because they're the ones that are going to kind of decide whether you can get in or not. Um, another approach, though, you could go to your city's disaster section, you know, Bosaika, which almost certainly exists, and say you want to join Volunteer Fire. That's another way. Okay. But how much writing yeah. do you have to do? Because like that's oh, my like, problem. I, I can speak okay, I can read yeah. a little bit, but handwriting's out the window. So almost zero. Uh, <clears throat> when you drive the vehicle, when you when I drive the fire truck, I have to enter into a log uh, how many kilometers I rode, which is of course just written in in Arabic numerals, and then I have to say why. So I might have to write Kasai, you know, there was a fire, or I might have to write. Um, Saimatsu Keikai. It was our end of the year patrol. And just, you know, get out your phone and, you know, transcribe the kanji if you don't remember how to write Keikai, which is kind of... Right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's no big deal. But, yeah, yeah, written is... There's virtually, like, no writing needed. Okay. And perhaps less fun, but mm -hmm. I hear you're, you're quite active in the Chonaikai as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Can you tell so, me about that? Because mostly I hear yeah. people trying to avoid being involved with the Chonai guy, but right, which is a which is a valid you know way a valid approach. Um, I I first joined a Chonai guy 
well, I should say first what played a role in Chonaikai when I was in my, um, my wife's parent, when I was living with my wife's parents and my wife there in the Jika and, uh, the, it, it, it was our household's turn to have, a you know, to have somebody be one of the Rigi, one of the directors of the, of the neighborhood association. And my father-in-law wanted me to get involved. And so he kind of said, you're going to go do it. And <laughs> then when I went and did it, this kind of elder statesman of the neighborhood, um, who was just a really great, a really great guy. He, he said, you know, uh, Derek should be not only one of the Rigi directors, but he should be one of the executive directors. He should be the, the scribe uh of the thing That's because cool. nobody just because nobody from our particular little part of the neighborhood was was one of the executives he's like we need to have an executive in there and so he had me be the scribe so i had to immediately take minutes of all these uh meetings oh, um, yeah but that wow. was a good experience that was a good what, experience. what a way to improve your japanese eh? <laughs> yeah it was really it was really funny but but they were super impressed when i brought a laptop and they were like oh we're you know we're moving forward uh in young technology <laughs> yeah it was funny um but yeah that was that was the first experience the the next was in my current neighborhood and because i was in volunteer fire i was actually exempted from doing the chokai stuff um it's one of the, you know, incentives kind of to be volunteer fire is that, you know, you don't have to like, take frantically takes notes PG. about this exemption. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this is a common thing. I, I don't think it is um, in other places, but, uh, but the, the current Chokai was just kind of having, uh, it was in a bit of a rut, I think. Um, and I wanted to get in there and sort of help steer things a little bit and so i did and that i'm on my second year of that and we we resurrected our our summer festival and finished it yesterday actually uh, oh wow the ginkgo so, trees one. no that's the other that's a different oh, one oh. yeah that's a bigger community festival um just our neighborhood summer festival we we oh, resurrected yeah yeah Icho Matsuri is another another one <laughs> yeah. wow okay yeah, <laughs> but it's good. Came on to the, the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I think Chonaikai um, stuff or Chokai, as most of them were called in Hachioji area anyway. Um, of course, it's the dreaded, you know, long meetings and just drudgery and whatnot. But um, kind of one of the main themes that I always harp on when I talk about living in Japan and integrating is nobody is going to give you the time of day until you contribute. So if you want to... Uh, pine on various things if you want to have a say if you want to bitch about things um you earn that right by contributing basically mm -hmm. uh, is how most people will treat you so um it's a very easy invisible way to do that it's the man in the arena right like <laughs> yeah i mean get in if the you have a problem get, get with busy. it yeah if you have a problem how th with how things are done then then come do things you know and, and you've got some really good blog posts about that yeah, I've, I've written a little I've, bit. I've, about I've it. been enjoying your blog since you left Twitter, and I was oh, missing thanks. my kind of Derek dose. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, some really good blog posts about about the the Chonai guy and the firefighting. So, well, thank you. Yeah, I uh, we'll link that I in the description if that's it. okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, one of the reasons I actually <clears throat> got off Twitter, other than you know the management and whatnot, is that. Um, I kind of just it, it was it was my main outlet for whenever I had a thought or whatever, and I kind of wanted to funnel my thoughts into more of a a bit of a more long form you know situation. So I was doing that, and and I do still, although I'm I'm also on Mastodon, uh, gradually releasing my thoughts uh, <laughs> now. So yeah. yeah, and then you've got the business as well. Yeah, I started my company my first company in uh, 2009 i was a i was a freelance translator for a long time starting around 2004 and then i uh i, I it got to where i was earning a living from that and i thought to myself you know sometime i'm gonna probably incorporate and if i'm gonna incorporate ever i should incorporate as early as possible you know so the established whatever year is earlier than you know oh. it would have been ah that's a good point i mean nobody cares but <laughs> you know it's um yeah it so what's the very very rough rough cost for doing that let's say you're not actually actively running the building be, uh, the business but you just want to establish it 
Oh, to incorporate a company, um, I think that it will usually run you like between Sanjuman and maybe Gojuman, right. all told. Just the little, you know, registration fees. And you have to get the, for example, you have to pay Sanman to a, a notary public. You'll have to, um, you have to pay various fees to get registered. And if you pay, a, as I did, if you pay a Gyosei Shoshi, an administrative scrivener, to do the paperwork for you, uh, which I think is wise for a lot of people, probably. Um, then that's you know also part of that cost. But I think it cost me around Sanjuman, maybe. Okay. Um, and then is there annual costs? Um, even if you're not running a business, you just got it as like a sort of on hold. Yeah, you, kind of... yeah. For example, um, the minimum corporate tax, at least where I am, I think it's similar everywhere. Is I think it's Nanaman per year. I 70, think that's similar. Seventy thousand yen. Yeah, yeah. You have to pay seventy thousand yen a year, no matter what your uh, how your company's doing. I think oh, okay. so. That'll be a running cost, you know, to think about. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure that there's a perfect uh, line where you exceed a certain income threshold and it becomes worth it to mm -hmm. uh, incorporate. Blah blah blah. But I just don't, I don't know what that is. I'm not fastidious enough to have calculated that or whatever. <laughs> so yeah. yeah so anyway I, I, I started that in, in 2009 yeah nice and that was initially just translating and then you kind of branched out a bit afterwards yeah so what happened is i i yeah i started running my existing translation business through it so all my i was a freelance translator so most of my clients were translation agencies and i just said to my translation agency clients now i'm a now i'm a kabushiki gaisha i'm a company so you have to pay me through this and they did and then but once I became a company, what I realized really quickly was bigger companies will give you the time of day now. They'll actually, you know, give you work uh, that they wouldn't have if you were freelance. Um, so in the translation business, at least in those days, um, it made a pretty big difference in the rates I could charge and in the work I could get directly and not have to have a middle, you know, middleman translation agency in, the, in, in between. So that was big. That led also to interpreting work. Um, I'm a really bad person at time management. And so um, I'm, I was always late with translations. Um, clients liked the translations and they, they didn't have to correct much, but they were late a lot of the time. So um, I shouldn't speak in the past tense there either. But, <laughs> but interpreting, um, I, I, have a, I have a talent for interpreting and interpreting is just go to the place, do the job, drop the mic and that's it. There's no time management required. It's all just crisis mode, you know, for a person like me who I, I'm self-diagnosed and not otherwise diagnosed, you know, ADHD. I think um, that's perfect, right? You just have to get it done. And it's a, it's a crisis uh, minute by minute. But when so you're you done, you prefer you're done. the interpreting to the translating? Um, yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. I really like interpreting. When, when interpreting goes well, it feels really, really good. It's like a Translation is way more right? even keel. Yeah. When it goes bad, it's really bad. <laughs> What's the balance for you now? What, what percentages would you say you do? Yeah, so the other business with that company, though, is consulting. Um, and now more than half of my business is consulting. And what kind of consulting is my interpreting business became very focused on medical device manufacturers and also now pharmaceutical manufacturers. And those um, companies have really specific rules they have to follow when they're manufacturing products. Um, for example, if a company wants to make uh, syringes in Japan in a factory and sell them to the United States, they have to follow the United States FDA rules about manufacturing. And they also have to accept that FDA inspectors will come to Japan to their factory and inspect the factory. Uh, and if they don't accept that, then the U.S. Customs won't let their product into the country. So what I do is I'll interpret that inspection and I'll also now as a consultant do a mock FDA inspection before they come. Uh -huh. I'll find all of the problems that the company needs to correct, get them into the correction stage. And when FDA comes, I'll be the interpreter and help the company to explain what they do to the, uh, to the FDA person. So it's a consulting kind of a thing now uh, beyond the interpreting. Okay, and presumably that's 
better paid than exactly translation yeah work. yeah so you're kind that of moving up the food chain as it were well i try and then but i like interpreting and so i do them both and um the but the consulting is is uh is more lucrative when it's not covid <laughs> uh-huh. right yeah <laughs> You took a hit for the the COVID. Oh couple yeah, years. I took a real nice hit. Um, all the companies, you know, um, built up savings, kind of just went to keeping everybody paid at the same level for for three years. <laughs> so yeah, I, I have a I have a total of what four employees and then myself. So um, yeah, with that business being a lot, a lot reliant on FDA coming to Japan and doing inspections, it was a real big hit. But, mm. yeah. right. but in the you're meantime, making up for that this year. I'm trying. I'm trying. <clears throat> but in the meantime, it gave me it gave me time to kind of um, think about how I want to transition, uh, not quite into retirement, let's say, but um, it it made me feel, you know, I think I want to spend more time locally. Um, I, I think a lot of people felt during COVID that it, that they maybe took a lot of local businesses and um, local kind of institutions for granted. Uh, you know, when lo- when local restaurants went under and you didn't have anywhere to eat except McDonald's and, you know, things like that. And I thought to myself, you know, I want to make my community Takao more interesting and more of a fun place to spend time, you know, whether you live here or whether you're a tourist. And um, so I started getting into... Um, starting that kind of a business yeah okay so I, yeah. diversify a little bit exactly yeah yeah i had time on my hands and um and frankly um there were covid loans available to existing companies um oh. that were for example um in my case um i got a loan that was to be paid back over 10 years but the first three years you didn't have to make any payments um, and there was no interest for the th- first three years. Oh, wow. um, so uh, the credit union came to me and they said, hey, uh, you know, you've had a long relationship with us. You've you've paid your vehicle loans. Do you want a co- do you want a COVID loan? And wow. I, didn't, I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't out of money yet. I was I didn't really need it. But they were basically saying, look, it's kind of just guaranteed and you just have it. And so I took it and. um and I invested some of it in the building I'm sitting in, stuff like that. So nice. So is that yeah. your Takao Mountain House mountain place? House. Oh, this is no. This is a different um, building that's now that that's towards Takao <laughs> Station, um, a couple kilometers from the mountain, and uh, it's just an old um, building that used to have a um, downstairs. I'm on the second floor, and the, on the first floor there used to be a, a series of Indian restaurants there, okay. and. The owner of the place decided that he wanted to sell it off, and so uh, I bought it. And I put in the first floor. There's an art gallery. Um, I, that was one of the one of the one of the small uh, one small dot on a what I hope to be a, a map full of interesting places. Uh, you know, in 10, 20 years in Takao, but um, there's this art gallery downstairs with this cool artist that makes miniature uh, miniature models of things and stuff like that. Um, okay what other things are you envisioning for this this chain of uh interesting places then well i want there to be a mexican place um around here (laughs) just so i can have a burrito (laughs) so i'm actually last night you're remodeling the the neighborhood to fit your taste oh yeah 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 exactly no (laughs) seriously like what would i want wait what do i want you know is the question i'm asking myself (laughs) um i think i uh i want to make it so that there is a place that sells burgers nearby. I want there to be a place that sells burritos nearby. Um, I want there to... Food, right? <laughs> I want Let's a stadium see. here. I want a library there. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, one of the things we're actually doing, uh, the next project for Anscapes is actually a shared satellite office space um, because we want to help well, we want to make money, but we also want to um, help there be more people spending time during the day in our community that isn't tourist tourism reliant. Um, and having spaces for big companies to let their employees work near Mount Takao uh, is something that there's a lot of demand for right now, but not oh, wow. um, any really supply. So we're going to provide that probably starting in about the 
the first part of next year. Nice. Yeah. Is that quite that a be... big location then? Yeah, we've got a location, a really good location that um, is a business that's going to shut down. Just kind of, uh, they've they've run their course, uh, and 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 they don't. It's a soba restaurant, um, and Takao Mount Takao has a lot of soba restaurants around it. Um, you know, which are which I would say are waning in their popularity in terms of having big uh, enkai. You know, like big big drinking parties there. Um, that kind of event has really, I think, uh, trailed off. So, so yeah, we're going to get that, that place. Would that office be available? Say people watching this, if they work remotely, they could go out and like drop in. For yeah, a day well, pack all the sun. it's a great question. That's our plan. Um, not to have it be exclusively that, though, because right. the big companies are kind of the more reliable. Um, you know, you can get a company, for example, to rent a certain amount of your space. And regardless of whether any of their employees come, that's just, you know, guaranteed monthly income for us. Mm -hmm. But we do want to make it so walk-ins can come uh, and work there. And we're actually we're actually right now kind of struggling with how to uh, how to ratio it. Um, uh, right. Exactly. Please. But we but we will be making that type of space. So, yeah, yeah. Stay tuned. You've got a visitor here. I'd love to do that. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, what we want to do is make it so somebody can come and work in a in an attractive environment uh, right next to the mountain and, you know, go hiking, come back, maybe grab a shower in the facility. Oh. Uh, the first floor is going to be a craft brewery. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was going to say, I hope you're going to serve delicious coffee, but you know, craft <laughs> there beer. will. So that's the other thing. We're also we're we're not sure exactly yet, but the plan is to have a barista be kind of the reception person so that you can get good solid coffee there as well wow so, okay so hearing about you setting all these things up i have to ask and obviously yeah, yeah i don't know how free. much you want to share but the funding for all this does it come from savings or do you like wait for a business to generate income to them for another one or do you get loans right so my parents are really rich no i'm just kidding oh. <laughs> i'm just kidding that's what I you always one. see in a, in a, in a news rich. article about a kid that made a great business it's like oh also his dad lent him a million dollars uh yeah. that's a joke no um so some of it started with money I had just accumulated with my existing, you know, company business. Uh, loans, loans are part of it. Takao Mountain House, for example. Um, and, and Takao Mountain House, to put it really quickly, is uh, it was just a, a house where people lived and didn't run a business. Um, but it's in a really good location next to Mount Takao. Mm -hmm. And it became available last year in March. Uh, and when it did, we kind of pounced on it. And we beat out probably 40 other different companies that were asking really? to lease wow. the place. And in that, we had to invest um, to renovate. So we, we used the same skeleton of the house, which was not like a classic or retro, you know, attractive looking house. It was just a, it was built in like 1990. So it was just the worst possible uh level of either newness or oldness but mm -hmm. we just uh kind of stripped it down to the studs uh with our own crowbars and everything and then we had it renovated um and we put a big terrace around it that you know in that we probably i and three other partners invested probably a total of i want to say 35 million yen maybe maybe 30 million yen and so part of that i got as a loan uh and we also got a loan from uh what's it called in english the seisaku kinyu koko uh, it's like a publicly it's like a public it's a government backed um lending uh institution that's pretty much for starting new businesses oh. uh and if you incorporate a company and start a new business the chances are you'll be able to get you know probably 10 million yen loan from there oh. so we use that uh -huh. So a lot of the above, basically. Nice. Okay. And you serve food there? Yeah. Um, so that house, we renovated it. And on the first floor, we made a about three-fourths of the space we devoted to a rental space, just kind of an empty concrete floor, the studs, and then glass around it on the outside. It looks nice, but it's very bare bones. Uh, that we rent to Solomon the brand that makes, you know, skis. And now they do a lot of mountain uh, trail running clothing and shoes. Um, and then we use the last fourth of the first floor for a cafe and a uh, craft beer uh, stand. 
So there's no indoor seating. You go to that stand and you buy your craft beer or your coffee oh. or your slider hamburgers or whatever else we're selling. And then you eat it on the terrace on the deck there. What's the capacity? Oh, the deck is pretty big. Um, I don't know how uh, how vulgar your show is allowed to be. Um, a lot of people online are talking about Derek's big deck. Uh, and I apologize for the... Uh, the the entendre there but um it's a it's a pretty big terrace <laughs> you had a meetup yeah. or something there didn't you oh the meetup i did last year in october was actually up at um what's called mount takao beer mount and that's up oh, halfway up the mountain it's just a big beer garden the... yeah yeah Cause, if yeah. i were running that i'd have more money <laughs> yeah right. but yeah we're thinking of doing a, a retired japan event somewhere so oh really <laughs> Not in Sendai? Where are you, Daniel? I, I don't think I've... Uh, Kamakura. Oh, okay. So you're yeah. in the place we wish we were. Uh, I want Takao to be like Kamakura, basically. Oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is nice here. But I do like going out to Takao. -san. I kind of discovered it just a couple of years ago. Been yeah, in Japan about nice 20 place. years. And I finally went to Takao -san a couple of years ago. Really I, nice. I, I, would, I should say, I, I want us to be like Kamakura in the sense that you can spend an entire day there. Mm -hmm. and not go to any one particular destination oh. within it so yes. you don't have to go to the you know big buddha statue or to the shrine or to the beach to have a whole day in kamakura right true that's what true. i want takao to be like oh, you don't have to get to the mountain to you know to have an entire day that's oh. that's the goal i don't want us to be maybe as crowded and uh whatnot as kamakura it is crowded but, here yeah 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 i like that vision Awesome. Yeah. yeah, I can't imagine people trekking up to Sendai for this. <laughs> I think we might have to have it somewhere more central. <laughs> yeah, if you need a place, let me know. I'll help, uh, help with the Takao area anyway. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was a good um, time. And then, um, yeah, 56 people came. I, on Twitter, I just said, you know, who wants to come have, have beers on October 1st? Uh, and 56 people ended up coming. And that was the day we opened Takao Mountain House. So it was really uh -huh. poorly timed by me. But um, that was good. <laughs> It's really good timing, no? I mean, you can sell out on the first day and set a trend. Like, Yeah, it was a fun time, though. Yeah. Awesome. So there's one more thing I wanted to talk to you about, which is the yeah, sure. politics side of things. Yeah. So right, I so... hear you might have um, things to say about politics in Japan. <laughs> I do. Well, I, uh, I came in... Uh, so I, I was here from 1998 to 2000. Um, I used to be Mormon. I grew up Mormon. And I was a missionary here. So I was one of those guys with helmets and white, you know, shirts and neckties riding a, riding a bicycle around. Um, I did that from 1998 to 2000. Um, I've since quit Mormonism and, and whatnot. But uh, I had that experience and I went back to the U.S. Um, I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, when I got back in 2000, a friend told me, you can go be a Japanese speaking tour guide in Las Vegas. And so I did. I went okay. right to Las Vegas, um, and I was a tour guide there. That's where I met my wife. She was a student at, at the university there. Um, but as I was a tour guide, uh, I would take, you know, either really big groups or really small groups of people out to the Grand Canyon or to um, the Utah National Parks or to Monument Valley or, or Death Valley or wherever. And sometimes they would be politicians. Um, it would sometimes just be me driving like a Jeep Cherokee and, you know, two people in the back um, and they might be VIPs or whatever. So I would talk to these, you know, various clients and um, and some of them were politicians. And I would start, I started thinking, you know, it'd be interesting to study Japanese politics. So I came in 2004 after my wife, my wife and I got married in the States. And my goal was to go study Japanese politics at a Japanese university. And so... We arrived in October 2004, and I hadn't done any planning. I just kind of showed up, and I realized I wasn't going to get into a Japanese university, you know, like for another at least year. So I researched who was my local uh, member of the diet of the net, of the lower house, and um, the, his name came up on you know the search, and had his office address here in Hachioji. And so I went to the office, and I just kind of knocked on the door. And I was like, I want to study Japanese politics. You know, can I can I volunteer or intern or whatever? And they, uh, I, I think they kind of background checked me as best they could, and then they 
and then they let me do it. So okay, wow. yeah, interesting. So what was the initial easy. reaction? Was it like what? <laughs> right. Well, I went. Uh, it, it was kind of just everything was poorly timed, as is my want. Uh, I showed up on January fourth, and um, they were still on their New Year's holiday. But there was one um, one of the boss's aides was there in the office. And he happens to be a big Beatles fan and kind of he spent a little bit of time overseas. So he wanted to just kind of see what was up and and he wanted to speak a little English and, you know, talk Beatles and whatever. So um, that was I think that was part of the reason that that, that was quite lucky. He opened the door. Really? (laughs) Yeah, I was. (laughs) You know, everybody said, don't, you know, don't just show up. You know, you got to you got to have an introduction for that or whatever. But um, it worked out. So they called me up three or four weeks later and said, yeah, if you want to come be an intern, you can, you know, um, come and uh, on this day and we'll, you know, we'll we'll show you what you're supposed to do as an intern. And so I went and um, and it was a lot. I, I blogged about this a little bit, but it was a lot of just very rote tasks um, that when I realized the whole of it had taught me just a ton about living in Japan and just, you know, linguistic uh, education and all kinds of things that that are really useful for me now. Things like entering the names of support of new supporters. So if somebody joined the, the boss's support group, I would have to enter their name into the database and that meant that I had to learn how to read all the name kanji, oh, no. um, mm. stuff like that. So if, if anybody gives me a meishi now, I mean, I can always read their name because I've just oh, had no. to read all of these crazy, you know, surnames and, <laughs> and first names, especially given names. I mean, I can't read it always with, with 100% accuracy because nobody can. But I, I have an idea of, you know, those mm. types of things. And, um, it, it made me have to learn every inch of hachioji. Just, you know, I had to go to visit people and and things like that. And so anyway, it just ended up being really, really, really educational. Um, So the pay was awful. Uh, Oh, so, so after I interned for a couple of months, he hired me as an aide. Um, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it it was April 1st, you know, and he he said, you know, on April 1st, uh, we're going to need a new, a new uh, privately paid um, aide, a secretary. And you know, do you want to do that? And so instead of going to college, I ended up, um, just working oh, for him. Probably wise, given what I've seen of universities. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I ended up doing going... politics at university. Like you're probably better off being in an office, aren't you? Well, what I did end up doing was going to Temple University Japan um, later. I didn't graduate, but I, I went for three years and um, I studied political science and, and there were a lot of um, professors there who you'll see on TV sometimes in the U S or wherever commenting on the state of Japanese politics or what's happening. And I had a lot of really good battles with those, with those types (laughs) of professors who would say something and I'd be like, no, you know, actually this is how it works. And, and I was a snot nosed, you know, just, just stupid kid also. So uh, a lot of really, really dumb arguments, I'm sure. But um, yeah, that that was a fun experience. So I, so I did that from 2005 through about the middle of 2006. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so a full year of yeah, year and a half ish, and I've and... still never completely stopped helping out with politics. Um, whenever there's an election, uh, etc., there's always some level of of involvement. Okay. Oh, really? Even was now? that all in the local area, or did you go to the diet and and stuff as well? My first, um, my first job when he hired me as an aide was to be at the diet, and actually I had to give tours of the diet building to sixth grade kids. Wow! So that was. Fun. <laughs> I bet that broke their mind a little bit. It did. It was great, and it's great for the boss because you know he had this 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 unique person on his staff. And the kids would go home from their field trip to the diet and be like, this white guy gave us this tour of the diet, you know? <laughs> and it'd and be more difficult questions. <laughs> yeah. It was more notable for them mm. than it would have been otherwise. Right. So mm. that was, that was kind of cool. So I was there, I would drive him around. Sometimes I'd be his driver. So we would, you know, pull into the prime minister's residence or whatever and stuff like that. It was really, really interesting work. Terrible pay. Really good. Work, <laughs> yeah. 
And I was, what, that was enabled what are some by living in my that, in-law's house. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what are some things that lots of people think about politics here that are maybe not true in your experience? Hmm. I would say um, both Japanese people and um, non-Japanese people seem to have an impression that there is a lot of kind of um, luxury and opulence surrounding these politicians and their offices and their lifestyles. And that may be the case, especially for, for example, like your dynastic politicians whose families have been in it forever. That may be the case, but um, my boss was not at all dynastic. He kind of came up from, from a, you know, just really average background and the office that we worked in both at the diet, because they hadn't rebuilt the office buildings yet, the diet buildings offices were cockroach infested. Oh. Um, just, you know, just decades of tobacco smoke on the walls, oh, no. just, just, just really nasty. And then the office in, in town here continues to be just really, really just, uh, <laughs> just like dingy, <laughs> just really dingy, old crappy computers, half broken like office chairs and so on tv when they show like a politician you know in in like a fictional drama or something he's always in this like super like leathery nice mahogany furniture office and i'm just like no no that's not not how it is so i, I and the other the other impression a lot of people i think have is um is is like everywhere that just you know politicians are really um really just really evil and craven and and whatnot and some of them are but um there is there's quite a bit of um i would say of of goodwill uh, of of sorry good intentions with with you know the politicians that you'll see on tv and stuff they they don't get um for example you know like senators in the U S they're all millionaires because they can like insider trade stocks and do things, do things like that. There's a lot less of that here, I think. Um, so okay. it, it's, yeah, it's an interesting world for sure. There's, there's a, there's a handful of like naturalized non-Japanese politicians floating around. Did you ever yeah. meet any of them? I think I met Surinan Marte, who was the first national level um, politician to be born at least in Europe or the U S he, he's from Finland. Um, I think there may have been others who, who were naturalized from being, for example, Zainichi Koreans or, or, or what have you. But um, I think I got to meet him, meet him once, but he was in a different party. So we didn't, you know, get to meet a time. He didn't hang out. Like, yeah. No. No. And that was it funny. Quite tribal in that way. Yeah. The parties don't, um, well, the the actual politicians they interact plenty, even with with people from not who aren't in their parties. Um, that happens plenty, but the staff don't you know fraternize a ton. You might be waiting for your bo- you know boss next to the other guy who's waiting for his boss and stand outside your cars and talk, but that was you know it's, it was it wasn't super interactive there. Right. Okay. So if someone was interested in getting involved with politics at the local level, what should they do? Just go and knock on the door on absolutely. January 4th. <laughs> no, they absolutely should. Um, um, it's so, I, I've, I, this is one of my main, this is one of the dead horses that I just beat constantly. Um, you're not prohibited as a non-citizen from doing almost anything politically here. The only things you can't do are run for office, vote, or give donations of money. Those are really the only three things you can't do legally. You can volunteer for somebody. You can stand at a station and give speeches. You can hand out pamphlets. You can do all of that stuff. Um, it's not le- It's not illegal. So um, now if you got involved with a politician who was seen by uh, the general, you know, powers that be as really extreme or you know terroristic or whatever then you could have your visa denied you know the next time you tried to renew it for example um Mm. that's something that could potentially happen you know just as a caveat but if just the mainstream parties mainstream politicians 
uh, there's almost no chance that you would get into any trouble at all. Um, and so what I always tell people is identify the parties or, you know, politicians, candidates that you like, that you agree with and go volunteer for them. You know, put your money where your mouth is. I really dislike when people just re- just complain and complain and complain about um, about things here as if they don't have the opportunity to do anything about it. You know, that, that really that really sticks in my craw. Okay. Uh, complaining would you, is fine, would you include but, you know, you the um stuff. would you include the communist party in a, in a safe party? Oh too? yeah, they're totally safe. They're totally safe. Cuz I like them. at least at the, the yeah. local level I like their policies. <laughs> Absolutely. Um I I I mentioned this on Mastodon the other day uh yesterday no 2 days ago at our at our community fe- at our neighborhood festival I spent an hour over beers with our local Japan Communist Party assemblyman, the city assemblyman. And we just talked politics. He knows I work for uh, an LDP politician. Um, but he and I had kind of finally got the first chance to sit down and really chat. And it was great. I mean, it's still like 80% common ground. It's still, mm-hmm. you know, it's still just local. This is what we should be doing in Takao. You know, how can we do this? How can we improve this? How can we keep the river from flooding? You know, stuff like that. <laughs> uh, so identify politicians or candidates that you like or, or political parties. And they all have offices in your town. Go to the office. You know, um, they're totally welcoming. Mm-hmm. I almost guarantee it. Uh, you know, there aren't any. I don't think there are any politicians who are so uh, set for support that they're going to turn away people that want to work. Ah, with right. <laughs> We had a comment from Sanjiro Ogawa. Uh, thank you. Uh, and they say, um, I thought as a foreigner that we cannot be part of a protest. You, is that something? No. I'm not aware um, of your, your right to free speech is not abridged in Japan as a, uh, as a non-citizen. Um, now, again, if a protest is illegal, um, and there are illegal protests here, uh, mm-hmm. you know, protests that have already been um notified to the police and the police are there and they will give you your space to have your protest etc you can participate in one of those no problem Mm. if you get into a riot i mean obviously (laughs) yeah it's a different story um on a broader sort of note all the different things that you've done so, so we hear about people being denied rent because they're a foreigner or something it sounds mm-hmm. like you haven't really come across many barriers uh, being a non-japanese yeah i i haven't but i've had a really privileged situation you know let me be clear about that um i'm a white american mm. guy there's no doubt that that's the probably the most advantageous non-japanese type to be Okay, so like I'm I'm completely acknowledging of that. Um you know, so so that that's what that's the first thing. The other thing is I came and immediately came and lived with my in-laws uh you know mm-hmm. here in in the the town and my father-in-law grew up in this area. So, you know, there were obviously those situations where they'd be like, "Oh, you're married to his daughter." Okay. Right. You know, and and I and even my my um, being accepted to be an intern and then a, an aide to a politician, I think when they initially background checked me, they were like, "Who is this guy? Um, who is this family?" He says he's you know married into, and I think they probably checked that out. Mm-hmm. So so I definitely have had advantages, and and right. it's very true that people get denied. Um, for example, being able to move into a particular apartment. Hmm. Um, the no foreigners a policy that some landlords have that's absolutely something that that happens yeah yeah and that's not good i i'm in the real estate business um not in apartments or anything but um the the, the problem really is that property rights in japan are really strong both for the owner of a property as well as for the tenant of a property. Mm. Once a tenant has entered an, an apartment and, and, and leased a place, it's nigh unto impossible to kick them out. 
So if I have an apartment house, let's say an apartment complex, and I rent out to somebody uh, and they decide to stop paying rent and, you know, cause problems and whatnot, I can't get them kicked out for probably a good two years. And, uh -huh. and it goes, it's an enormously complex and long process. So what happens is people who have mistaken notions about, you know, foreigners, foreigners as a monolith, uh, they only think about the worst possible, you know, non-Japanese people they've ever heard of, right? And then they just say out of hand, okay, no foreigners. Yeah. And and we all know that, you know, foreigners is such a it's such a silly classification because it involves all of the world's population that's not a Japanese citizen, right? I mean, it's an incredibly mm -hmm. diverse group of people. But a lot of people just say it's a risk factor that I don't want to have to deal with. I don't want to have to you know, look into it. And so they say no foreigners and it's just really terrible. So I'm yeah. hoping to see that, you know, get better. Mm. Okay. Well, we are retired Japan. So yes, yes, <laughs> we, we are. We ask you about your, your personal finances as much as you're willing to, to talk about, you know, what are you planning yeah, sure. and what are your thoughts on your road to eventual retirement? <laughs> right. I, I, I am, I am definitely not, a person to be giving advice on um, on preparing for retirement in Japan. Let's just start there. Uh, I'm not doing a ton of, for example, let's say stock investing or you know that kind of a thing. Um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but when I uh, during during COVID, I when I started thinking, you know, when I when I don't want to or maybe don't have the energy to interpret or to do consulting anymore, man, what am I going to do? Uh, Cause interpreting, especially as a young person's game, uh, it, you have to have a really quick um, turnaround mentally and uh, you know, you're, you're going to decline mentally and cognitively as time goes on. So assuming that I can only do that for maybe another, you know, 10 years, I'm 44 right now. Let's say I can only do it another 10 years. Then I got to think, you know, who knows? So uh, basically, I've tried to start creating passive income uh, is the is the main point. Uh, this building, um, rather than renting a space for my company, I now have this building. So my company doesn't have to pay rent. And then I've got an, a tenant downstairs. Um, so that's one part of kind of the thinking is if I can retire, let's say around 55 or 60, and I've got let's say four or five or six properties around town that produce rental income, then maybe I can retire and have passive income, you know, that, that feeds me. Uh, that's one thinking. Another is, um, so you know how there's, there's, there's term life insurance, there's kakeste, you know, life insurance where you just pay and you never see that money again. But if you die, then it, then it gets, you know, paid out. But there's also the savings type of life yeah. insurance, right? Which is, it's not, it's not a big growth vehicle for your money, right? Uh, you might get an extra 0.5% on top of what you would get if you put it in the bank. And, and you know, you know that putting in the bank here is, is like putting it into your mattress, right? I think the best account is like 0 0.3 now. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that's a big sales point. It's like we pay. <laughs> 0 .3%. Yeah, yeah. They're 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 paying for banner ads online to to tell you about it, right? Yeah. So, so one thing though, um, my insurance guy, who I get, you know, life insurance, and who I've gotten, um, what's it called, uh, uh, uh hoken, um, like school cost, educational, yeah, educational insurance. cost insurance where you're kind of just saving up again um, money for when your kids turn a certain age. My guy who sold me those, uh, he has an Aflac, Aflac agency. And about 10 years ago, they had a product where your company could insure you, you know, life insurance. And it, oh, well, sorry, I'm along the road here. You can hear these motorcycles. Um, so, the insurance is a savings vehicle for your company. And when you die, your company gets the money. And since I'm the sole owner of my company, that means my wife would get the money anyway. So it's oh. similar to just me being insured. 
But the, the really nice point of this is it's all savings. So it comes back like 110% of what I put in in the end when I'm 60 or something. But half of that amount that's paid, that, that my company pays for this insurance every month is deductible is as an um. expense. And um, I think that the government saw this product as a loophole because they ended it right after I got it. Oh. And so my company's got it and we're, I'm grandfathered into it and I'll pay into it forever uh, and get half of it, you know, as an expense, which is really helpful um, for the company. Okay. Um, but that's Are one of the Are you also doing things. the Kyosai? I'm not doing a Kyosai. Chushio Kigyo Kyosai is similar. No. But you no. can put 70,000 yen a month really? away and it's, um, it's all tax deductible from your, your revenue. Oh, maybe I need to do that. Thank and then you. there's a there's a tor sam borsai i think so it's okay. like bankruptcy protection mm -hmm. but again you can put in you know eighty thousand yen a month tax deductible into that no way i need to look into this that's we'll great put thank you in the description. <laughs> look yeah. at look at you helping me here this is fantastic yeah i mean um really like i i always say like my my retirement plan is is mostly the absence of a retirement plan i mean it's really really light it's very common it's very common yeah, and then of course I'm I have to pay into the Kosei Nenkin, so doing that. And um, again, uh, I think most of what I'm those vehicles that I've just talked about, and then trying to acquire properties that could either be sold or that could produce um, income after I retire. Those are kinds of those are those are kind of the whole thing right now. Okay. I haven't I haven't delved into stocks and things like that. Um, so I'm kind of molding it. That's a, that's a personality thing. Like the, the, the seem to be like the stock people and the real estate people. Mm, and they be. don't mix very much. Like uh, I'm, I'm very much yeah. not a real estate person. Um, yeah. But my godfather in Germany, he he won't touch the stock market. He's got this, <laughs> this empire of apartments instead. So I mean, yeah, I think you've got to pick what 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 you're comfortable with and go with that. When, when you talk about real estate investment um, from an American perspective, especially people think about these wild fluctuations of property values. Um, but as you I'm sure know, uh, property values in Japan are, are not um, volatile. And if you have though property that's near a station, a major station, then you can at least count on it not losing a ton of value. So you don't invest in the building, as everybody knows. Um, but the property, um, you can at least probably count on it selling, you know, for most of what you paid for it, if it's uh, if it's done right. So that's the thinking there. Yeah. And if your plan to turn Takao into Kamakura works, then those property values should go up. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm incentivized. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. It's a self-interested plan. Um, it's both community and self-interested. Absolutely. So win, win, win. We like yeah. it. Yeah, and uh, if I, if 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 I and my partners and hopefully the other people that will kind of jump on the bandwagon with us succeed in in making Takao that way, then the property values definitely will have will have uh, appreciated. Exactly. Are you looking for more partners or? Well, um, I so we have a, a next project that's being offered to us. It's a big property that somebody's going to stop running a big business on. And they're saying to us, after having seen Takao Mountain House, hey, do you want this? Uh, we'll prioritize you, you know, because we, we think you can do something cool with this. Um, that one, I might need to do something big in terms of, like, gathering investment. So stay tuned. Maybe. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you, if you want to do a guest yeah. post on Retire Japan. Well, that'd be interesting. Yeah. I mean, if people, I mean, I don't know how, how, how confident I would be in, in asking people to park their money in my project, but uh, I'm pretty confident in, in what we're doing. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see. And then you know, when the details get uh, get shaken out with all full disclosure of caveats and, uh, and whatnot, we'll mm -hmm. see. Absolutely. It'd be great. Awesome. All right. And any final words for our, our listeners out there tonight? Um, yeah, I mean, I would just say, uh, I, I don't think that everybody can become happy in Japan, to be honest. <laughs> I think that for some people, Japan's just not the place for them, uh, if they've come from, you know, other places. Uh, 
and and so for some Japanese people, it's not the the place to be mm-hmm. for them, you know. Um, but what I would say is, if you want to integrate into your community and you do want to have like a a life here where you feel like people treat you as part of their community and not just as the outsider, you know, token foreigner or whatever. I would say the best uh, way to go about that is to contribute first, to find a way to contribute. And if you start finding ways to contribute, then people start wanting to hear what you have to say and they start to respect you as a human being more than as a, a foreign face. That's just, uh, that's kind of my thinking. on it. Awesome. I think yeah. we can all agree with that. Cool. Yeah. All right. Thank we, you we so have, much for coming on. Yeah. Sorry, we have just had one uh, quick question pop up, actually. Yeah, I'm happy Senate to answer whatever. Bid. Yeah. You got time? Okay. Yeah, I've got, uh, I've got all the time in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you. Um, so, hi, Derek. When you were working at the diet, did you see the, in quotes, dormitories where some politicians live? And if so, what were they like? Yes, I did, actually. Um, so, they used to be not as nice. And then they built a pretty nice one in Akasaka. Uh, kind of just down the hill from the diet. Um, they're not, though, they're not like super high luxury. They're just in a really nice place, you know, mm-hmm. location. Uh, but they're not uncomfortable by any means. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I would just say that they're, they're decent. Um, if you had to pay for it on your own, it would be, it would be expensive just because of mm-hmm. the location, especially. But yeah, they don't, they don't, but again, they don't live in the lap of luxury or anything. Most of the diet members, they are eating curry rice in the diet cafeteria and stuff. And it's pretty good, but it's nothing crazy. It's nothing special. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not veal and suckling pig every night with. Uh... Exactly. Yeah. It's nothing like that. Yeah. And when, when my boss would go to these fancy restaurants to have these like, you know, little meetings that they do at the, the, the diote, you know, the traditional uh, places. He would always come out and be like, all right, Derek, let's go get some real food. We would, <laughs> we would go to ramen and, and whatnot in the middle of the night. Yeah, that was our thing. Yeah. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, I'm sure we'll have you on again at some point. Oh, that'd be <laughs> great. Yeah, three, thanks so much three. for having me. I appreciate it. I, I, I lack knowledge of retirement strategy completely. But if you're willing, it'd be great to be on again. Nice talk. Yeah, about. definitely. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can, we can, yeah, talk you through. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Awesome. It was really good. It's the first time we've spoken, actually. It's it's really cool to to finally, you know. It's funny, right? We inter- we've interacted for a good four or five years, and now finally, exactly. Let this not be the last uh, interaction not. of normal speaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll come crash your uh, your mountain house sometime. Perfect. Please do. All right. Thanks a lot, Derek. Yeah, right. very nice to speak to you. Thanks, man. Thanks, Thank Daniel. You. Cheers. Good night. Bye. Good night. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> what an active that was fantastic. <laughs> Such a positive I can't attitude. Imagine yeah, doing some of that stuff. That. Uh, it must be exhausting, but yeah, he seems to really thrive on it. And it, learning seems to be a big outcome for him, doesn't it? Ah, yeah. Yeah. So the 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 political stuff, especially. Mm. Like very much kind of rote learning, very old fashioned way of doing it. But actually, I had something similar. So when I was doing weddings, mm-hmm. so I've done 800 weddings and, and that involved yeah. memorizing scripts and, and delivering scripts. And I learned so much Japanese from that, just the grammar and the, the words. Right. And uh, yeah, so because yeah, I think that kind well. of just memorizing. Yeah. So yeah. but you can use that language then because you've memorized it. So mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine how useful that would be in a, but yeah, <laughs> badly paid and possibly uncomfortable at times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, fascinating. Awesome. Yeah. So for the first time in two months, we're actually going to have a proper Retire Japan TV. <laughs> yes, yes. Awesome. Yeah, so people uh, watching, if you're watching, watching or listening for the first time, we do the interview first, which we've just done. And now we're heading to the second half where we'll cover a variety of topics that we have prepared Yes, starting with news. So a few news stories from the last couple of months. Yes, Uh, so I haven't prepared. Um, I think you put this on the list. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning is the first news item. Yes, yes. So yesterday morning, uh, we went out with the family uh, and we stopped at a family mart. And I got an iced latte from Family Mart. And it came in a Mission Impossible cup branded uh and i said to my wife oh look mission impossible and she was like we will go and see this tonight 
And I was like, oh, oh okay. That, that marketing <laughs> works. <laughs> so well done, Paramount, for, for that. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I would I would say don't go and see Mission Impossible <laughs> Dead Reckoning because oh, it was dreadful, like oh, really really bad. Like I, I I like the first Mission Impossible and the, the subsequent ones were fine, mm. but this was just so bad. You can tell the writers are on strike. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, of course. Uh, so like, the plot was because... just it was it was the Fast and the Furious level. Right, but without that kind of self-aware laughing at itself, like it was Tom Cruise being oh. deathly serious about this nonsense. So I didn't enjoy it. I'm not going to see part two. It was part one as well, three hours long, and it was part one. Right? Yeah, I didn't realize. That. Oh, <laughs> wow. Okay. So I don't, I don't recommend it. The seat, the cinema was very nice. That we got the special seats. Oh yeah. You know, yeah, you pay an extra five hundred yen for like the armchair. Um. So that was great. But yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend it. Wait for June two instead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Assuming um, you've seen June one. I haven't seen June. <laughs> um, speaking of the cinema, actually, I can tie this in with finance. Uh, a, a friend of my son's actually tipped me onto this. The one hundred nine cinemas chain has got a, a cinema near us. I think it might be all, all through the country. But, yeah, um, there's anyway. one near us. Um, oh, right. just north of Sendai. Yeah. All oh, right. So I don't know if it's the same in all of them, but for a thousand yen, you join as a member, and it's not an annual fee. That's a one-time only fee, and then you're a member um, as long as you go at least every six months, once every six months, and then you get the premium seats for the price of a regular seat. Ooh, absolutely brilliant! Very nice. So every time we go, we get a premium seat for no extra cost because of that one-time one thousand yen. Now the, the competition is quite uh, tough, so sometimes. When the tickets become available, you have to wait till just after midnight to get them online because they oh, fill up. Oh right, because everyone everyone's getting the deal. free. That's the that's the problem, isn't it? Because you're not paying yeah. anymore, so there's that. Right, there's more right. people going for them. Right. Yeah, but yeah, check out if if you if you sort of dismiss the premium seats because they're too expensive, check out the deals in the individual cinemas because yeah, there's some good ones going. Yeah, we only go like maybe twice a year to the cinema, so it's, mm -hmm. I think it's well worth right. it just to upgrade the experience a little bit. You get these barriers really nice. between you, so like you're not sitting oh, next to random oh. people either. Like, oh, that's fancy. Very nice. Yes. But choose your films wisely. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so that was our headline news. Right. <laughs> Moving on to a lesser news. Um, so one thing we have here is uh, health insurance. This is from actually last month, but as uh, people may have heard, the My Number cards are inevitably going to be uh, um, compulsory. They're not officially compulsory yet, but they're making it harder and harder to avoid it. And health insurance are being planned to be retired or rather converted into the My Number card in autumn, fall 2024, reports the Asahi Shimbun and many other newspapers. Yeah, and you actually saw this, didn't you? I did, yes. Have you got the um go to actually the slide? Uh I was in other oh, people. Yes, I was in the hospital this morning. Why I'm lying down doing this. I apologize uh, for the for the sort of the bad posture, but I got a slipped disc at the moment, and so I'm having treatment for that. Um and yeah, in the hospital, alongside the regular sort of check-in booths where you put your hospital card, they now have these uh my number check-in things. So yeah, you, you can go there without a Hocken card because it's all built into the my number card if you've chosen to go on that route to go that route and i think it will be compulsory from just over a year's time so there you go it's coming if, if like yeah unless it gets cancelled which is possible because oh. there's a lot of um like the my number systems getting audited at the moment because of all these like mistakes and data leaks and things so We'll see. It, I mean, I, I think it's going to happen at some point. Whether it happens next autumn, not sure. But yeah, I, I actually had a pleasant experience with this because when I was doing my taxes last year, mm -hmm. um, it automatically pulled in all my medical spending because it was linked to oh. my number already. And that was really convenient, to be honest, rather than having to make an Excel sheet myself from the receipts. So right. that's Should one positive of having it. Should we explain actually why you want to do that? Um, I'm not sure if it's only if you do the like the self, uh, what is it called, self declaration thing, or if it works if you're a, a full time employee. Oh, but... I'm not sure. I was I was doing my own taxes because I'm right. unemployed now. 
right. <laughs> so I don't get to do the Nem Mats Chose anymore. Um, but yeah, that was very useful. Um, and, and so what it is, for people who are not aware, if you have a, um, over, is it Juma yen, I think, of medical expenses yen. Yeah. through the year, yeah, then you can then s submit that to the tax people at the end of the tax year and you get some of it back somehow. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, so the amount above 100,000 yen. So 100,000 oh. yen is, is you pay. And then anything between that, uh, anything above that and below 200,000, I think, um, mm. you get to deduct as a deduction. So if you spend more than 100,000 yen, say you spent 130,000 yen, you'd get to have a 30,000 yen deduction for those. Um, right. So it's, and... it's nice. And it's a household as well. It's not just yours. It's, mm. it's any member of your family. So that can add up quite quickly. I think ours is going to be more than that this year. Yes. And so I'm not, not a tax uh, advisor, but, um, please research this. But according to my wife, we can submit uh, if there are taxi uh, receipts for going to and from the hospital, that's okay. In Create, like the, the local drugstore, if it's, oh, now what is it now? If it's some kind of medication. So like washing up liquid and, and then soap well, doesn't count, but if it's proper medication, uh, off-the-shelf medication, that is covered as well, I think. Um, our son had um, a series of um, brace, like teeth braces for for a while, and that was all uh, included in the... But the amount and that that's you can expensive to the in Japan, eh? Yeah, that put us over the <laughs> limit, so that's quite good. But yeah, research that if you're, if you're in that position. Awesome. Um, the next news item was ah, from the Mainichi Shimbun. This is also from last month. Japan to expand the skilled worker visa system to address the labor shortage. I feel like we keep getting lots of these stories. Um, well, they keep announcing these policies. And right. um, sadly... Like we had a we had a related news story the other day that said um, the Filipino nurses that Japan is trying to recruit they have a system for them as well to enable them to come to Japan. Only seventeen people applied this year, um, probably due to a combination of the weak yen mm -hmm. uh, and then horror stories of bad pay and conditions and kind of broken promises to to people that have come over before. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're not able to earn, you know, their nurse certificate or whatever and gain normal employment. So Japan keeps shooting itself in the foot, I think, yeah. with this, where they, they need labor. Uh, but when people come over here, they don't treat them properly. And so they're going to, yeah, they, I, I think I get the feeling that Japan doesn't quite realize that it's competing for labor now. Yeah, Everyone yeah, wants labor, is. right? Every Every yeah. country wants trained medical stuff <laughs> so if mm -hmm. you want them to come here rather than europe or or somewhere else you have to treat them better or you have to give them an incentive to come so yeah i think south korea's population uh decreases on a par with if not or if not worse than japan's isn't it their um then birth rates much lower isn't it right mm -hmm. than japan's um and china as well china's china's got oh, a real gray yes thing because of the the one child policy so right, right yeah. but i saw a, i saw an article today that was that really shocked me um even though i'm aware of the problem uh, apparently now for the first time ever there are fewer than 10 million households in japan that have a child huh? the population is what about 100 million 126 so. million 20 million and only 10 million households have a child that's what the stats were. So I was like, whoa, that is a scary number. <laughs> wow, okay. Yeah, well, we need to yeah, bring people, attract people into the country. Um, so the way the, the government has proposed this in this uh, newspaper article is there are two sort of levels of, of visa for people coming here long term. A uh, number one visa and a number two visa. And the number one visa lasts for five years and cannot be renewed. So you come here, yeah, come to Japan, come and live in Japan. Thank you very much. After five years, bye-bye. You're not allowed to come back. Who's going to take that? Like... Right. Unless you upgrade to the number two visa, which then you're allowed to renew that and basically live here indefinitely, I think, as long as you pass the Japanese language and, te or, and technical skills exam. And so the sort of change in, or the proposed change, I think, is that currently only two industries can qualify for that like improved visa, uh, construction and, and something else, or shipbuilding. Um, and they're increasing that to include fishery, agriculture, hotel sectors, things like that. But 
if the pay is low and yeah, if we lose in competition to other countries, it's not really going to make a big difference, is it? And again, it's it's just another bait and switch, isn't it? So if you pass this test, if mm. we, you know what I mean? And then, you know, you get to your five years and they're like, oh, sorry, bye. Which is what happened yeah. to the, the previous generation of Filipino nurses, which is why now they've got 17 applicants. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Russell in the comments says, AI and robots are Japan's solutions to the decreasing population. Yeah, I think to an extent. Well, the irony yeah. is that, you know, AI and robotics can't do, you know, healthcare work or construction work or all these things that have shortages at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> they can replace yeah. bureaucrats. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the bureaucrats can do the nursing work in the future. <laughs> um, what else do we have? Ah, now the next one is specifically for UK citizens. Uh, so just bear with us a minute if you're not a British citizen. Um, and this is something you mentioned in a video uh, a month or so ago, I think, about mm. national insurance contributions. So if you've got a British state pension, you can voluntarily pay extra to get the full pension, even if you don't live in the UK. And at a very deadline, low rate. At a very low rate, that's it, yes. And the deadline was well, next Monday, a week today, but they've extended it again. So you've still got time if you haven't done that yet. I, I think they're going to keep extending it because they're never going to clear the backlog. <laughs> I tried calling them, actually, this year. Um, and I think I called them like, 11 times over a couple of weeks and never got through it they kept the system kept oh. hanging up on me so like oh. yeah they're not clearing this backlog anytime soon right right but i think as long as you like submit your form your claim it might take yep. a while for them to deal with it but effectively you're okay you've done what you need to do yep as long as your your applications in the system i think it should be fine um yeah. for most people i actually need um, to ask them a question so <laughs> that doesn't oh help i me. see uh, <laughs> Uh, there have been discussions on the Retired Japan Forum about this, so if you want more details, then hear other people's experience on there. Yeah, that is probably... We'll, we'll link to the video, um, but also, yeah, if you go to the forum, there's there's a lot of... There's, there's a number of threads on this. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the next bit of news I have is for people who are interested in buying stocks and shares in Japan, maybe inside a NISA, for example. And this is something that... Uh, so oh, first disclaimer, disclaimer, I own uh, shares in this stock. It's NTT. And why it's noteworthy. Own shares in this stock. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, why it's noteworthy. Pump and dump is, Daniel on, on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So um, oh, so I opened with my son an Anisa account for him. Uh, he's a uh, university age and he got a bit of money, but you know, obviously not a lot. And NTT have just done a stock split this month from each single share, which was 4,200 yen-ish at the beginning of this month, I think, split into 25, which is big. That's, that's I mean, stock splits do happen, but 1 to 25 is uh, quite unusual. So each NTT share is now worth 168-ish yen. And the reason why, why that's noteworthy in Japan is because usually in most accounts, you have to buy a minimum of 100 shares of a stock, which means the minimum amount for a 4,000 yen share is you've got to have yonju man, for, um, 400,000 yen to buy the minimum amount of that uh, stock. But now with this stock split, the minimum amount to buy NTT shares is uh, 16,800-ish yen, which is very low compared to most other stocks on the stock exchange here. And That's very I, clever. Um, mm -hmm. Apple Apparently did they that did it a few years ago. Oh, did they? Oh, and yeah. it worked really well. So they, they, yeah, they went from like a thousand dollars to like eighty dollars, and then oh. even though it's the same, yep. yep, the value is exactly the same. It's just easier to buy for the small, you know, for the normal kind of consumer. So yes, yeah, this yes. might work quite well for NTT, possibly. I th I think so. Um, so they, I think one of the things they said was they want to encourage you know smaller retail investors to invest. And certainly, so from my son's point of view, he just bought 200 shares for like some, uh, 30 something thousand yen, which would buy him probably next to nothing of other companies. But he can get this mainstream company that gives a dividend um, for that amount. So, this is not stock uh, investing advice, do your own research. Um, but it's interesting because I think the influence of NDT might mean that other companies might do the similar thing to hopefully make it much more accessible for smaller retail investors to invest. 
And it's interesting because the reason or one reason that we had these stock lots in the first place oh, was to make it more expensive. So really? yeah. I think the reason they brought this in is because the, the Yakuza used to buy one share. Oh. And as a shareholder, they would then attend a shareholders meeting and disrupt it until they got paid off to leave. Oh. And so to, to, as one of a number of measures to, to reduce that, the company said, okay, you, you can't just buy one share anymore. You need to buy a hundred. And that then became a substantial amount of money and made it much more difficult to do this. So, so but now it's going, it's going back. So they're, 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 they're making it cheaper to buy because obviously this, this probably doesn't happen quite as much anymore or even at all anymore. Mm, mm. Oh, well, good bit of history there. Um, and Space Cup in the comments, is that NTT code 9432? Yes, there are several NTT subsidiaries, but the one I'm talking about, which I think is the main one, NTT group, is N432. Uh, sorry, 9432. And it's confusing because the other subsidiaries all have NTT in the name, but when you the, the official name for NTT is not NTT, it's Nihon the Tsushin something. I've forgotten what it is. Yeah, and SoftBank. If you want to buy SoftBank, there's like three or four different ones, so you have to be oh, careful. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you get the one you want. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, and you've been watching TV. Ah, yeah, I've been watching TV. Um, yeah, with my back, I've been spending time lying down watching TV. I have a little uh, show I want to talk about. It's I think it's relatively recent. It's on Netflix. So apologies if you don't have Netflix. Uh, it's called Get Smart with Money, uh, hosted by oh, what's his name? Oh God, Seth, Seth, uh, Ravit, Seth, Ramit, Sethi. Ramit, Sethi. I love okay. Ramit. I'm such a big fan of his. Right, uh, his book with this sort of scammy title, <laughs> "How to Get Rich" or something, is apparently yeah. very good. I haven't read it. Uh, I bet he's going to find it now. So I haven't read the book, but I am interested in him because he does have a good, a good reputation. I will teach you to be rich. That's it. Yes. yes. It's a great Apparently book. It's really good. good yeah. I'm a huge fan of his. He did a great YouTube interview the other day that we linked to in uh, next, this week's Monday Read, if you want to mm. check that out. Yes, yes. But um, uh, yeah, I love Rami. <laughs> yeah, and so he's hugely popular, especially in the States. And he's now put out this um, Netflix uh, show. Um, it's well worth watching. It, I think it was like five, six episodes or something like that. Uh, it's easy to watch, but it's still got lots of very good advice beyond the usual, you know, make a budget, spend less, blah, blah, blah. He's approached it in a much more kind of intelligent and sort of individually focused way. And uh, so, yeah, I just picked out some of the highlights for me. Uh, and one was, oh, so in, in the series, he has a few people which he sort of uh, follows as a case study, individual case studies. And they range from somebody with a lot of student debt to somebody who's got a high income and just happens to spend a lot. And then a family who just, I've got no idea how much they're spending. Uh, so highlights for me are a high income doesn't mean much if you don't know how to save and invest. And several people in the show, you, like, he goes through their finances right at the beginning without actually meeting them. So he doesn't know who they are. All he sees is their credit card statement, their sort of income statement, the bank account. And it's surprising how accurate he is. And yeah, some of the income is like, wow, how, how do you need financial help if you've got that income? And it's because they don't have the, Sort of the financial know how to make sure they keep that income. Um, another highlight was your circumstances can change at any time. Um, so hearing the stories of you know, some of the people made that very clear. And of course, we've had COVID, so we've kind of learned that. Well, the hard way. we're very familiar with that, aren't we? Like, <laughs> so I've lost my job twice oh, in Japan. Yes, yes, involuntarily. Um, yep, I've been laid off in the past. Yeah. You, your, your, you know, your current back oh, problem has has not yeah. been great for you, has it? No, I had to cancel my trip to the UK and uh, and delay some work assignments on one, yeah. Um, uh, another one from the show is paying off debt can change your future. And um, it, I mean, some of these, they sound obvious, but when he goes through it and you see it applied to a real person in one of the case studies, it really sort of brings it home that debt is the real thing that seems to be crippling, like financially crippling most of these people. Um this is obvious. Starting a small business can help lower wage workers. Uh, it's kind of obvious, but um, it's, it's the, the, um, I can't think of which case study that was now. 
Uh, Wasn't it a dog walker oh, who was like it was. taking photos and drawing on. pictures of the dogs and, and yes. that became really profitable? You know what? I'm getting confused here. I'm ever so sorry. This is not the, the rabbit show. I watched that and then I watched immediately afterwards a show called Get Smart With Money and they're both ah, very good. Okay. They're both recommended. Mm -hmm. So I'm ever so sorry. I'm getting mixed up. But they both do similar things where they get people, go through their cases and give them help. Right. And this particular oh. one was... This is the one with Mr. Money Mustache in, isn't it? Yes, I think so. He's one of, uh, like, they get four people to, I yes. saw this actually. Yeah, they get right. four, four different people to, to give, to coach these different families, don't they? Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, so I'm really sorry for getting these mixed up, but they are both very good shows with very kind of similar overlapping advice. Right. So this particular one, starting a small business. Yes. Uh, there was a lady who has a background in art and design. And she wanted to be an artist, but basically found that impossible. So she ended up working temporarily in a bar or something and had been doing that for years. And it's like, okay, this is like my full-time job now. How do I get out of this? And the advice was not follow your passion, go and do art and it'll work out. The advice was, why don't you start up a little side business that can make you money right now and then build from that and use the sort of the artistic side, not as the, the business in itself, but as a sort of an addition to the business, like something to support the business. And the example that she gave was, um, what work could you do this week that would get you money by Friday, right, right now? But, and uh, the thing that she came up with was dog walking. She's done it in the past, I think. She loves dogs. And so uh, the, if, if I, I really needed to, I could go and knock on people's doors and like try and walk people's dogs, and that would get me money by Friday. And so the professional's advice was, okay, so let's tie this in with your interest in art go to the park or a dog run or something, sit there with a sketchbook, draw a little picture of, you know, cute dogs that you see, and then, you know, a couple of three-minute sketch, go and take that to the owner and say, hey, I thought your dog is so cute. I made this uh, sketch for you. Um, by the way, my phone number's on the back. I've done dog walking <laughs> in the past. If you ever need dog walking, give me a call. And I thought that was just a brilliant idea. And it worked. She did it, and a couple of people gave her a call. She started walking dogs. Uh, that you know, built up trust, and then they told their friends, and she might not want to do dog walking forever, but it allowed her to escape the bar work that she hated, do something that she enjoyed, bring in some work, and then, you know, that kind of a springboard to, to other stuff. And she's more in control. So I, I, that was a really good uh, sort of uh, way of thinking, a particular situation, and finding a way out of it that was not obvious, at least to me. Um yeah, other, other highlights from the show, earning more can mean spending more. Earning more does not necessarily mean you've got an escape route to your financial troubles because if you spend more, it cancels it out. And then the, the final one I've got is the focus is not cutting spending, it's cutting waste. And going back to Ramit, waste is different for different people. So just because you're spending a lot on one particular thing doesn't mean you're spending unwisely because that thing could be really you know, important for you. It's the waste, the stuff that's not important for you, where you want to cut. Awesome. Yeah, it, it was a good series. Um, and is and Ramit's one is too. So if you've got Netflix, mm -hmm. they're both on there. Um, and I'd recommend both. Um, if if you like Ramit, he's also got podcasts. He's got like a hundred episodes of him talking to couples oh. about their money. And it's like a, a you know, kind of financial counseling session almost where it's really interesting <laughs> it's it's almost voyeuristic because you're like wow what do you do with your money really like <laughs> uh, and people's kind of hang-ups and, and their psychological kind of anchorings around money are really interesting and you realize that actually it's all about your psychology more than anything else mm, how yeah, you feel yeah. about money and how you you dealt with money growing up and how your family dealt with money and how you communicate around it's yeah fascinating stuff we'll try and find a link to that as well then in the description <laughs> if we remember a big description <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, our deep dive today is books and specifically um, books that we found impactful in our life. Uh, and I think this is really interesting because it's not just finding the right book. It's finding the right book at the right time. So just to give you a really quick example. So I read two of the huge kind of money books um, quite early on. So I read Your Money or Your Life 
um probably mid 2000s like 2007 8 ish and i read the four hour work week similar kind of time i can't remember when it came out but but more or less when it came out because i used to read uh, tim ferris's blog um and your money or your life just blew me away it, it completely changed my life i read it and and i felt like that scene in the matrix where you know you start seeing the code you know your your worldview changes your your everything the foundation of reality changes and that's what that book did to me it was amazing and i read the 4 hour work week and it didn't really do anything for me i wasn't ready so mm. it, it's an amazing book but it didn't have any impact because i wasn't receptive to it at that point uh, and actually i went back and reread it this year and i'm just going through it going oh, that's amazing that's so good why didn't i do this why didn't i absorb this mm -hmm. 10 years ago you know because it's all stuff that i'm thinking about now but i just wasn't ready for it so it's not just the right book it's the right book at the right time and so yeah. so it might be worth going back and, and redoing books that maybe didn't hit you the first time or that kind of thing but yeah that really made that impact on me basically i agree with both of those yeah um the um your money or your life so i heard this recommended a lot and it's funny because there used to be a show on british tv when i lived back in the uk called your money or your life by alvin hall a really sort of charismatic fun character and he had a book called your money or your life which i had uh, and um so i saw people recommending this book and i thought you know they're saying it's life-changing i thought well, it's a good book, but I don't remember it changing my life. And then I realized they're talking about a completely different book called Your Money or Your Life by <laughs> it's, nice. uh, Joe Dominguez, Dominguez and Vicky Robin. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, both are good. But the one we're talking about, Joe Dominguez and Vicky Robin, is, yeah, is exceptional. And one takeaway from me, I remember, was uh, it would talk about sort of thinking of, uh, what was it now? Not necessarily, uh, thinking of your dollars or the money that you spend in terms of your time. So how much money, let's say you earn 10,000 yen per day, you want to buy a new pair of jeans, it's 5,000 yen, that's half of your working day. Would you work for half a day and, and you know, be paid in jeans. those jeans, yeah. basically? Yeah, yeah. And that, 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 that that's they, a really useful metric because it, it makes you realize, you know, how expensive some things are yes. in terms of life. Uh, and it comes back to this thing that, you know, you can always get more money. Money is infinite, but you cannot get more time. And so time is more valuable than money. And and most people, I think, aren't aware of this. And I wasn't until I read Your Money or Your Life and, and really started thinking about it more. So, mm -hmm. And then I think they sort of talk about a kind of chart where you've got some kind of side income or passive income or something at the bottom, hopefully gradually increasing over time. And then you've got your spending a bit higher up hopefully decreasing over time and where those two lines cross that's where you're financially free mm. yeah and so yeah. It, and like, they, they recommend like, putting a right huge chart on your wall and plotting it every right. month yeah i didn't yeah. quite go that far but the, the concept really stuck with me yes yes because yes. because there's two things you can do right you can increase your passive income or you can decrease your spending and they're both equally powerful Mm -hmm. so you're not stuck at your whatever your current level of spending is and, and therefore you know i've got to build up this enormous nest egg to fund that you can decrease it you know by being smart mm -hmm. about what you do with your money and accelerate your, your journey to either freedom or security or whatever you want to call it mm. yeah. yeah so we're both uh, in agreement there i think on those two um well, so, well, well, did, so you, you enjoyed the four-hour work week I did right at the beginning. I mean, I've always had this sort of dream of, of having my own business or some kind of entrepreneurial thing. And I'm still trying to work that out. <laughs> but I love, love reading business books and autobiographies and things like that. And yeah, when that came out, it was like, oh, yeah, this is the dream. And um, I remember his three things in particular. It was, uh, what is it? Eliminate, automate, delegate. How to like free up your, your time. Again, going back to time being your most valuable resource. Those sort of the three things you need to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. And building your muse business, right? That funds your lifestyle mm. and then you can do whatever you want. So, yes. Yes. Uh, that's 
yeah, I remember giving that book away to somebody after a discussion. And that's the only book that I've actually given away to somebody who <laughs> willingly, you have to read this. That's how much I sort of value the information in it. Um, and then I bought it again because it's so good. Uh, right. So, um, okay. So I'm excluding those two from my list because they're on your list. So uh, the next top on my one is how to win friends and influence people, which may not be surprising for many people. Andrew Carnegie, it's an old classic. It's sort of a cringy title, and I kind of had to read it because, oh, it was in a film. It appeared in a film. Somebody's reading it. And I was like, okay, what is this book? Uh, you know, it's a terrible title, but I keep seeing. And personally, I found it absolutely wonderful and life-changing. And one of the key things I remember, um, which just sort of came back to me this week, actually, after I'd had a bit of a hard time online, um, if you, oh, what is it now? If you come across somebody behavior that you can't fully understand then if you sort of frame it as everybody wants to feel important that kind of helps you to deal with it, i think and it's nothing to do with finance or anything but I, I find that in so many situations we all just want to feel important and sometimes we don't really know you know the correct way to feel important but whatever we do in some way it's because we want to feel important well warren buffett credits that book with most of his success because he said he, oh, he read yeah. it early on and, and he's used it ever since so oh. oh i didn't know that um yeah and there's and he's, he's, he's i think he's made a huge amount of money by being his kind of affable personality in interviews and on tv and all the rest of oh. it like that's definitely boosted his brand and his his yeah it's it's a multiplier you know he could have he'd mm -hmm. probably be successful anyway but by being this kind of like charming guy he's, he's much more successful and he says that's all down to the book because he was he wasn't anywhere near as charming and personable before he read it oh, really? oh, oh. <laughs> um yeah there's there's many it's a variety of sort of bits of advice in there isn't there and um, i highly recommend it yeah, okay my, next one, my next one is die with zero i've done uh, mm. maybe a couple of blog posts about it it's it's a flawed book it's not a fantastic book. Uh, I think it probably could just be a blog post. But the concept is, it's it, again, it's tying into time and money. and But he introduces like a, a different scale. So the, basically the concept is that you should aim to die with zero. I, you should aim to spend your money before you die. Uh, because if you die with loads of money, that's a waste. You didn't use it to its full potential. Uh, and he spends the whole book explaining why this is the case and how you can think about it. And uh, a lot of his kind of points are based on the fact that there's certain things you can't do later, you know, that oh. need you to be healthy. They need you to have time. They need you to be in some ways young in some for some things so like if you want to you know go backpacking you're probably better off doing that in your 20s you don't want to go backpacking when you're 80 you know it's not going to be tim, fun tim ferris does uh, cover that as well i think doesn't he in the four hours yeah he's got his mini retirements kind of concept mm. so it's it's yeah. it's similar so i mean obviously it's it's it seems like a universal truth to me, but I thought Die With Zero put it really, really well. Uh, and mm. I found it very useful, again, because I was, I was getting up to that kind of retirement stage. Mm. Uh, uh, and I was starting to think about this stuff. So I really recommend it, um, especially if you are a natural saver and investor. So you need to read that if it's easy for you to save money and not spend money. Oh. Because you're bad at spending money. So you need you need to hear the other side of the equation. <laughs> That's it's something we don't normally cover, isn't it? Yeah. I should probably do a video about it. <laughs> yes, good. Yeah, um, you you have a YouTube channel, do you, Ben? Um, yeah, yeah. You might not have seen it. Oh, really? <laughs> I I message Daniel every day with like my <laughs> stupid little YouTube exciting stories that are not interesting in the slightest, and he always screenshot of me, the views. So. <laughs> Yes, the uh, he's, Ben's been working very hard on the uh, Retired Japan YouTube channel recently, so it's worth taking a look at the, some of the recent videos that cover a variety of topics and really good, uh, just really good discussions in the comments as well on the recent ones. Oh, the the one today was amazing. Like the comments are better than the video, so even if you don't watch <laughs> the video, just go and read the comments. <laughs> mm. 
So I'm nodding here. <laughs> so no, 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 no. Um, right. right. My next book in the list is a finance one, personal finance one, The Richest Man in Babylon by George S. Clayson. Oh, I thought I got my copy out, but I don't. It's a, it's a thin book. It's written in a slightly oldie worldy kind of English. I've seen some people complain it's a little bit hard to understand, but I didn't find it too bad. Um, my son does not like reading unless it's got pictures in it, manga pictures in it. Um, and this is, but I really want him to sort of grasp personal finance because it's not taught in schools and it should be. And this is the the one book that I have asked him to read because it's thin and I find it easy to read because it's written in the style of a story. So I feel it's getting the cross concepts very, very well. And um, yeah, he did actually read it and in his teenage way, it kind of implied that he didn't hate it. So I think that's that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and Fantastic. Um, he's, uh, one of the things I remember from that, which is relevant to investing, is the, the one point where the guy's got gold coins or something and he gets some advice to invest it so that the, chil the gold makes children and then over time the gold's children makes children and then the children's children makes children. Basically it's about interest, earning its own interest, earning its own interest, it's compound interest. But the way it just sort of talks about it, as in your your money makes children, which makes children, which makes children. So your grandchildren, in money terms, you know, will be sort of looking after you in the future. I really like that uh, sort of visualization. That's funny because I could not finish that book. Oh, really? Maybe I didn't read it at the right time. Oh, ah, maybe I should give it another chance because I've got it on Kindle yeah. somewhere. But uh, yeah, mm. maybe I'll, I'll I'll dig it out and and try again. But yeah, I don't know. Didn't didn't hit me. Ah, okay. <laughs> there you go not all books yeah so if you if you don't like a book it's not you it's just not all books written for everybody and and maybe it's not even the book it's just not the time oh the timing know? yeah come back yeah. and and like i tried to read lord of the rings i read the hobbit when i was like nine i think mm -hmm. and i loved it and so i thought wow the lord of the rings and i tried to read the lord of the rings and i couldn't it was just too hard for a nine-year-old I, I couldn't get into it but a couple of years yeah. later I tried again and it was amazing. So it, oh. it's, it's a timing element too, I think. Um, My next book is mm -hmm. Oversubscribed by Daniel Priestley. Oh. So I read that recently and it just blew my head off. Um, it's basically for business owners or freelancers. And it's basically talking about how to get your business so that it is oversubscribed. There's more people trying to buy your stuff than you have stuff to sell. Uh, and that's going to drive the price up. It's going to drive demand up. It's going to make it more fun to, to work in your business. And uh, yeah, it's an amazing book. And he's a great speaker. So he's got lots of interviews. The Ali Abdal interview with him, Daniel Priestley, is really good. Oh, so yes, yes. if anyone's into podcasts or, or YouTube long form stuff, that's a good place to start. Yeah. Over to you. Right. Um, so this, um, I'm going to go into a little detail for this one. And I'm going to bet that you haven't heard of it. It's called The Tiger That Isn't. Okay. Oh, I haven't heard okay. of it. Okay. Okay. It's by Michael Blastland and Andrew Dillnot. I'm not even sure if it's still in print. I think it is. And I think they worked together on a BBC Radio 4 money program early 2000s, I think. And it's it sounds dry. But I, I got it because it was a it was like the Economist book of the year in two thousand nine or something. Um, it's about statistics for ordinary people who don't really like statistics, and they cover the way that statistics is in our world and where we see it on social media or in the news or whatever. A couple of examples. I've actually got an excerpt which, which I'll put in the um, that somebody has printed a, an excerpt with their permission, and I'll put that link in the description. But a couple of things are we often rely on averages too much mm. when it's not appropriate. And one example they give is if you've got a blind, oh, sorry, a drunk person walking down the busy road, okay, they're sort of veering from lane to lane, left and right. On average, they're walking down the middle of the road and they're personally perfectly safe. But in actual reality, they're swerving from side to side and they've probably been hit by a car. So in that case, average is, is useless metric. And similarly with, um like the average income when you say the average income is uh, like what, 300,000 yen or something that's not the sort of average that we often think of in our head 
if you go to normal, arms, all these it's not the normal income, income, is it? It's, it's right skewed. because it'll be skewed by a few billionaires who will have you know crazy, crazy income that sort of shifts it up. Um, but in our minds, we think, oh, the average must be like pretty much what everybody's roughly got. And then a second example I re uh, recall a lot is random. Randomness does not does not mean evenly spaced. And so we see things happening in clusters. And one example from the book, if I remember correctly, is there were um, multiple cancer cases in this one particular village or town in the UK that had a mobile phone tower near it. And the people in the town eventually got together and pulled down the tower with a tractor or something because they were convinced it was causing these cancer cases. And there was no research, I don't think, to definitively show either way whether it was or it wasn't. And statistically, it could have just been random chance. But we don't think it's random because mm. no, it can't be coincidence. There's several things happening in one place. It can't be coincidence. And the great visualization that they give is if you take a bunch of rice, easy for us in Japan, and you drop it on a table, all the, um, what do you call it, thingies of rice, beads of rice? Grains. Grains of rice, thank you, <laughs> will not be evenly spaced. Some of them will be clustered. There'll be gaps where there's no rice. And that's what random looks like. Um, and so now whenever I think of something happening or not happening, it's like maybe that's just you know random chance. It doesn't mean there's a particular pattern there. We want to see patterns, but maybe it's not. Um, yeah, I found that extremely helpful. And that's important when you're investing in stuff because it, it looks like you know, oh. there's a pattern or something's obvious, but it might just be random. Like a random walk down Wall Street, which is not on my list, oh. but that's a great book um, yes. about how investing is random and you know yes oh yeah laurie in the comments thank you michael blastland he started more or less now produced by tim harford so tim harford is a sort of well-known eco uh, media economist in the media in the uk and i didn't know michael blastland had started that thank you yeah there's a connection there uh recommended so we will have all the names of these books in the description obviously nice yeah, my next one is Millionaire Fast Lane, which starts off with the scammiest little story. So you said Ramit's book was was had the scammiest title. This has the scammiest story. So the beginning of the book is the author, as a young boy, sees someone drive up in like some supercar, you know, like a Lamborghini Aventata or something. Uh, mm -hmm. And he sees it and he's like, oh, my God. And he's like, what do you do? And the guy's like, I do whatever. And he's inspired from that point on to, to make money and become a millionaire so he can buy a car which is just stupid, but the book is great. <laughs> so again, it's about business and freelancing and about how to actually make money, which is to provide value and create systems and all that kind of thing. But really good book if you want to, if you're in business or you have a business or you're a freelancer or something. I should probably read that because I've, I've read the Kindle sample and given up with it probably because of that story, but it's worth sticking with them. I, I I've read it a couple of times. I, I find oh. it really inspiring every time I read it. Uh, yeah. The guy, the author's gone off the rails a bit. Oh, really? So like, he's got a forum and he's he's written some more books, but he's gone a bit like right wing American nutcase a little uh, bit for my liking. But yeah. this this first book is really good. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Don't don't go to his forum and be put off. <laughs> right. <laughs> um. Good. I have a couple of um, autobiographies. I love reading autobiographies. And the first one I have is but one I read a long, long time ago. Maybe when I was at um, university, I think. Um, Richard Branson, Losing My Virginity. I think he's written follow-up since then. But that was one of the first ones I read about business. And the reason why I remember it is because I wanted to be, you know, a young entrepreneur and be famous uh, like him. I'm not necessarily famous, but be successful like him. And reading his book, made me think, okay, I don't want to be exactly like him because <laughs> he's very <laughs> clear about the sacrifices that he makes. And he does it because he loves it. He's like, he's totally happy. And so a couple of um, examples. One is, um, I'm not a sacri sacrifice, but when he was younger, his aunt dropped him off a couple of miles from the house. And he was still like an elementary school or something and just drove off. It was like, there you go, find your way back by yourself. And I think, you know, he was crying in the street and eventually he had to just like, keep walking and eventually found his home an hour or two later or something but apparently that taught him you know how to be strong and resilient or it's one of the things that taught him how to be strong and <laughs> sounds slightly uh, psychotic actually <laughs> okay yeah maybe i don't want to go that far and then uh, a thing that happened to him later was when he got married 
I think it was one of his parents, gave him a Bentley as a wedding present. It was a very nice wedding present. And later on, a few years later in his career, he was starting Virgin Records and he really wanted to sign, pretty sure it was Mike Oldfield. And Mike Oldfield. Oh, that was, was his breakout, wasn't it? Getting right. Jubilee Bells. Like yes, he knew company. it would like this was the key, this would be the key signing. He desperately wanted to get it. And uh, Mike was not interested. And then he said, Okay, what would interest you? And I think Mike said, you know, okay, maybe if you give me the car, I might be interested. And Richard said, Okay, it's yours. <laughs> it's like, that's your wedding present from your parents. But that's like business comes first, family comes second, kind of thing is the message I got from that. So very interesting to read. Okay, I don't want to go that far, but I do sort of admire the sacrifices that he's made, or at least I respect the sacrifices that he's made. Okay, cool. Um, All right. Well, I've got I've got two. I'm going to put these together because they're similar. So okay. the books, Dune and Lord of the Rings, uh, in my opinion, possibly the greatest kind of fantasy setting uh, and the greatest science fiction setting. Uh, and I believe you've read neither of them, Daniel. So oh, perhaps it's time to try. <laughs> More seeing the films. <laughs> they are they are book stops as well though. But June is is so like it's so quotable. So much of it is is like in my head. Uh, and the Lord of the Rings as well. And both of them, the film adaptations were wonderful, I think. There's so like the Lord of the Rings trilogy is is mm. incredibly faithful to the the source material. Mm. You know, as someone who's read the books a couple of times, I was completely happy with how the films turned out. Uh, and the same with June, the June that came out last year. I was like, yes, this is this is good. It's it's close to the books. So there is an older one, isn't there as well? June film. There's there's three or four. So there's oh, there's yeah. um there's the Sting one, <laughs> where Sting is the 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 he's Fade Rauther, the one of the bad guys. Oh. Um, and that's okay. It's a bit gory. It's a bit weird. Um, oh. and then there's a there's a I think there's a TV series from like the early 2000s that was okay uh but this oh. recent one's wonderful and there's one that was planned hmm. that never got made that looks amazing there's like a, a book treatment of it but um yeah but the the, the original novel uh, is yeah i read it early on hmm. and i loved it so hmm. okay something i need to do thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so, sorry a cup of tea has just arrived thank you very much oh. <laughs> I would like oh, oh sorry it's only for me <laughs> apologies for that um i get distracted now um right um oh yeah so i have another autobiography and it's difficult to sort of narrow it down but this is just one i only read this year it's called don't tell me i can't by Ooh, cole don't summers that. cole summers is pretty um not not very well known i think he should be um he wrote it i think aged 13 or 14 or something like that and sadly died last year just over a year ago i think at age 14 or 15 or something and so how can a young teenager write an autobiography and it is you know it's written in a sort of child's or, or a young sorry young person's way um but that makes it very sort of fresh easy to read and some people have even said that no you know he can't be a real person but I've seen, uh, in particular, his his death reported in, in newspapers, and it seems totally you know, real and genuine to me. He lived in, oh, so I don't know much about US geography, I'm, I'm afraid, but... Oh, I've seen a sort of, documentary about him. Oh, really? Oh, mm. I haven't seen that. But yeah, so... Amazing in the US, story, isn't it? Right, yeah, sort of US farmland, brought up in US farmland. Uh, his dad was... Um, some injury and sort of confined to a wheelchair so his mum effectively had to look after the dad he was homeschooled because of that and after a while he realized i'm a bit different to other people because he just wanted to you know study and do things by himself not realizing that he that society didn't really sort of um, allow it and so he wanted to start his own business when he's nine or something he asked his dad you know how can i be a billionaire and his dad's i don't know you want to um, ask Warren Buffett or something and so therefore he spent hours watching interviews with Warren Buffett as a nine-year-old or something and yeah he really did achieve an awful lot in such a short time which is just inspiring in itself that you know, what I'm worried about you know if I start this website is it going to fail what will people think of me and here's this young guy who's just like picked up stuff done it if it failed he learned from it it's incredibly inspiring 
Yeah, he he would have been a, a Richard Branson, right? If he hadn't died yeah, suddenly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't I'd forgotten about that. So I have seen that documentary, maybe on, on YouTube, but I'd forgotten about it. So yeah, I'll definitely check out the, the book. Mm. It's good. It's a nice easy read. All right, I have more fantasy novels because that's what I do. <laughs> so, I, I want to recommend the first book of the Three Body Problem series. There's three of them. Uh, I've read all three. They were good. The first one, I think, was the best. I, I, I really enjoyed it. The other ones got a bit kind of abstract, so I enjoyed them less, but the first one was amazing, so really recommend that. I, that is one I have read, and yes, I agree. That's by oh. the Chinese author, I think. Yeah, yeah. It? Yes. Yeah, loved it. Um, just like you, all of them, but the first one in particular, the, as as the sort of concepts unfold. <gasps> oh, I, I told my granddaughter about the dark forest theory, and we had a lot of fun with that. So, ah, oh. yeah, yeah, it's very good, and it goes through sort of time periods quite quickly. I think, isn't it? Yeah. By the end, yeah, it's like okay, it's it's forty million years in the future. I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but the first book's really good. You don't need to read all three; the first one's mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, I have. Uh, yes, uh, I, I added a couple since we, we talked about this. Before, oh, I've actually. got one more after this. So. Ah, okay then. Um, influence the psychology of persuasion. I thought we oh. have to mention this. Uh, it's more a sort of a marketing book, but I think it's relevant for. I think there are so many things actually about marketing that are relevant for anybody, even not interested in marketing, because you go into the combini or you see an advert on TV. And when you understand the sort of marketing strategies, you think, aha, I see what you're trying to do to me there. You're trying to, you know, get me with menu. this strategy. Well, yes, yes. You didn't put the dollar number or the yen number on there. You're trying to trick me by making it not look like uh, sort of money. Yeah. So, yeah, um, it's a very, very good book. Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Robert B. I'm not sure it's Chaldini. Chaldini. Is it? Chaldini. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I tried to put um, an excerpt from that in our university entrance exam. Oh, and they wouldn't let me, but I tried. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he covers, I think, six or seven or so uh, strategies. And yeah, you see, once you've read it and you sort of take them on, take them in, uh, you see them everywhere. Um, well, worth reading, even if you're not into marketing. There's another one I see people talk about called Presuasion. I think it might be about by him as well. It might be a follow up book, but the, yeah, the influence. Is, is has become a classic. I think Ben is looking for it. Uh, I thought what? I had it, but I don't. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Cool. All right. My last one is uh, autobiography and kind of philosophy kind of thing called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. Oh, it's by a guy called Harry Brown, who is fascinating. So he was a US presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party. He created the permanent portfolio, which is a huge deal in investing in personal finance. And he was basically very stubborn. <laughs> and this book is amazing. It's basically how you kind of can ignore parts of society that you don't like. Rather than trying to change laws, you just um, kind of ignore them kind of thing. Uh, and I found this really a really interesting read. What do you mean by permanent portfolio? Okay, so the permanent portfolio is a it's a portfolio design that says your portfolio should be able to deal with inflation and deflation and uh, growth and, and depression cycles of the economy. It should be able to deal with all of them. Uh, and the permanent portfolio tries to deal with it by having allocations of like stocks, cash, gold, and something else i've forgotten Bonds. i don't use it myself but i know people that do and the historical returns if you do back tests on it are pretty good so ah that sounds like ray dalio uh, yes it's has... very similar so ray dalio updated it uh, and oh, put in, like right. some alternative in investments in there yeah tony robbins is like slightly scammy investing book it, it is all about that right ah the, yeah ray dalio calls his version the all-weather portfolio and 
yeah, one of my um, my um, uh, Ideco actually is roughly based on on that. Oh, okay, nice. And so yeah, yeah Harry Brown made it, and he also had some ideas about how to live in the world without being encumbered by pesky laws and regulations. So. Wow. <laughs> okay, it's on your top list. Okay. Um. I'm putting a little bit of a, a wild card here, and it's kind of it's a very sort of practical book. It's Presentation Zen by oh, Professor nice. Gar Reynolds. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. So it might be kind of weird, like top ten, really, but it's just sort of been a big part of my uh, career, and uh, it came about when I started work as a developer evangelist. So my background is in, in programming and stuff. I started work as a developer evangelist, and my manager gave all of us on the team this book because we had to do you know, presentations at events and things. And not knowing much about making a presentation, I was very comfortable talking and going and waffling on, as you can probably tell, but not how to make the slides and stuff. And so I kind of just followed this book like step by step. Okay, you say do that? Right, I'll do that. And consequently, they, they went down really well, all the different places I went to. Because the, the, it, it basically says, make sure you've got big text, don't clutter the slides, um, cover this be, um, to not make the audience bored or something like that. It's explains how to give presentations and how to design your slides in a very good way for non-designers. And yeah, easy to follow. One criticism I had from one of the, the teammates on the, was that if everyone has this book, then everything's going to look the same and it's totally boring. Why can't we put some personality into it? And so if you have that skill and ability, go for it. But if you don't, this is a great blueprint. Yeah, hugely influential. Eh? I mean, you can see it in, in TED Talks, in, in all sorts of places. Like. Mm. He was huge for that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I got that, used it a lot when I was doing oh, presentations good. back in my academic career. I wasn't sure if you, if you knew that. We have, we, we've we kept our list secret, secret from each other so we can have surprises. So I wasn't sure if you knew that. That's good. Awesome. Um, I, so I'm sorry, I added a bonus one at the end, actually, because I realized I hadn't gotten any uh, fiction books on my list. So I'll put my Ooh. top fiction book, which is, I, I don't read a lot of fiction, but this one, Recommended by my wife, stuck with me. Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And the reason why I'd never really read it, because if somebody had said Dostoevsky to me, it's like, well, that sounds like highbrow, complicated stuff. I'm not going to understand that. You know, I can't speak Russian. It's a great read. It's just, yeah, it gripped me all the way through. Um, yeah, wonderful book. Awesome. Yeah, I kind of read all the classics when I was a lot younger, you know, from school and, and stuff. And I feel like I should loop back and read them again. Mm, yeah, you know, like all do. the kind of Treasure Island and, and you know, oh. that kind of, you know. Yeah, maybe a project for when I'm properly retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take Stop a mini retirement. With YouTube. Follow Tim Ferriss' advice, take a mini retirement. Definitely. Right. Well, those were our book recommendations. We will have a list in the description with links. And yeah, on to the next section, which is forum shorts. And forum shorts is just where we talk about some interesting threads that came up in the Retire Japan forum, which you can click through and read. There's no need to register if you just want to read stuff. But if you want to ask questions or comment, you will need to register and make an account. But that, again, is, is pretty easy as well. Okay, so a few threads that are active recently. Uh, we had a thread that's called How Are You Doing Financially After COVID? That was quite an interesting thread. It's an old thread, but people keep popping in. And generally, across the board, across the retired Japan population, it seems that people are actually done quite well financially from COVID, whether that's from traveling less or, you know, spending oh. less because they weren't going out or like getting, uh, you know, COVID money from the government or, or loans for their business and so on. So. Obviously, some people have had a really bad time if their business was affected or if their work was affected or if their family was affected. But generally speaking, financially at least, uh, most people have seen uh, an uptick from, from the COVID years. We had a whole bunch of threads about Kokumin Hoken. So Kokumin Kenko Hoken. So whether that's you know finishing work and having to switch health insurance providers uh, and various things that come into that, like you can sometimes stay on your employer's insurance. That might be cheaper. Or you can go to Kokumin Kenko Hoken, uh, adding dependents and things like that. 
there was a thread about moving to the city from the countryside in Japan because they're very different experiences, I think, and some people are probably going to be better suited to one or the other. We had a question about a life insurance that matured uh, and could either be taken immediately or the person could wait three years and get an extra 30% or something, and which would be the better decision in that situation. That was quite interesting discussion. So please have a look at that if you're interested. Uh, we've had a thread for a while that's occupations, what do you do? And it's really incredible how diverse the <laughs> Retire Japan Forum membership is. Like some of the My jobs on teacher. No, I mean, there's, there's, there's all sorts of really specialized jobs that I, we, we, yeah, you have to ask people, you know, what do you actually mean by that? <laughs> oh, wow. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had a housing question, which is, you know, should I buy a house? Uh, and it turned out they weren't really asking about buying a house. So that was quite interesting too. Oh. Uh, we had a thread about how to help children learn their parents' language living in Japan. So, you know, if mm. you're an, Spanish speaker and English speaker and your kids growing up in Japan, how can you best help them acquire your language as well as Japanese? Uh, and that was a very interesting thread. We have a thread about kind of permanent residency success stories. So people who have received permanent residency, that was a good one. Uh, a thread about the summer heat. And that wasn't, that was before I did my uh, video. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a number of uk pension threads so the voluntary contributions uh, from abroad topic and then an interesting thread about selling a restaurant so someone who owned part oh. of a restaurant uh, and was thinking of selling it to his partners so that they could leave japan and so on so that was a that was a really interesting thread as well so please do head over to the retired japan forum and just have a click around there's a lot of stuff on there the link in the chat we'll have the link in the description as well very good um so now it's uh what is it um oh questions ah so we did have a question earlier on actually from mm. space cap thank you again um so space cap space cap says i'm starting my first job next year congratulations i've heard that typically the company i work for will be paying for my insurance instead of me is this true? Okay, I'm guessing this is talking about Shakai Hoken. So pension so and health insurance. And health insurance. Uh, and yeah. yes, I mean, the, the, the company is paying it, but they are deducting half of the payments from your salary uh, and they are paying the, the company contribution on both of those. So uh, yes and no. <laughs> So you got your salary after it's been paid for you by the company. Yes, and and also with with um, uh, with uh, Shakai Hoken, so the company employee version, the company pays half, uh, and the em employee pays half. So yes, Tech they're paying half of it for you, and they're deducting the other half from your salary before you get it. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I think that was it. Hey, just the one question. Yes, yeah, you got. So that. people are stunned by our amazing content, <laughs> or, or yeah. no one's actually here. <laughs> yeah. Good. Cool. So uh, our next good one, session yeah. will be in August. I've actually, f <laughs> I need to check when the date is. <laughs> Terrible planning. Let's see. So the next session is going to be uh, August twenty first. That'll be interesting because I will be getting out of hospital possibly oh. the day before. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm going to hospital again next month for knee surgery. So I'm going to get my uh, oh. meniscus repaired, apparently. Oh, dear. Um, which is supposed to be a really quick 30 minute operation and just three or four days in hospital. I should be getting out um, on the 20th. So I might be sitting down. I'm, I'm currently standing at my standing desk, but I'll probably be mm. sitting down at my sitting desk yeah. next time. So <laughs> good stuff. Um, and we'll have a mystery good. guest no. next time. Yes. And Details then we're going to take a break after soon. that. We'll take a break after that, I think, will we? We are, yes. So this that will be the final episode of Retired Japan Season 1. That'll be our 10th episode. Uh, we're going to take a break in September, October. 
And hopefully we'll be back in November for season two of Retired Japan TV. So, mm. o tanoshimi desu ne. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not the M1 now. The M1 is next uh, t- Monday, 21st of August. Don't touch that dial. Awesome. Right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Daniel, for joining us today, despite your unfortunate condition. That's right. And... I'm happy when I'm lying down. <laughs> <laughs> See you next month, everyone. See you.